Today we begin uh, our uh, survey of the um, historical books of the Hebrew Bible. So I just want to remind you all, uh, so we have up on the screen, you have the canon chart that we looked at at the very beginning of the course. So we've done the Torah, we read most of Genesis, we read a good half of Exodus, we read representative bits and pieces from Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, so we finished the Torah. Now, in the Jewish division of the scripture, we're now moving into the this, this section called Nevi'im, or prophets. But paradoxically, we don't get to the prophets right away. The section called prophets, Nevi'im, has actually two halves. The first half are historical books, Joshua through Kings. That's what we'll be looking at this week and next, Joshua through Kings. And then we actually get to the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve, which we'll be getting, getting to also in due course. So right now we're beginning our survey of the historical books, looking at Joshua, Judges today. Uh, Samuel and Kings will begin on Wednesday, and that will spill over until the week following. So that's, this is where we are. We are now uh, in the section called Nevi'im, Prophets, but we're reading actually historical books. And if you have a Christian Bible, the Christian canon, there's a section labeled historical books, which includes Joshua through Kings, and then much else also is tacked on uh, after the book of Kings. Okay, that's simply where we are in the Bible, in the section called Nevi'im. So, just a reminder of, of some information that floated by already last week. We have something called D, which is the book of Deuteronomy. Right? D is that mysterious source, editor, school, that has produced for us the book of Deuteronomy, with its distinctive rhetoric, its distinctive theology, uh, its distinctive, well, its own distinctiveness. That's D. There is a school, uh, out of the Deuteronomic school comes the writer, writers of those historical books, Joshua through Kings. We call that DTR, the Deuteronomist, or the Deuteronomic school, in which the book of Deuteronomy is one thing, and then someone taking the book of Deuteronomy, taking its ideas, taking much of its rhetoric, taking its uh, fundamental theological conceptions, and then write, writes them up in historic, as, as a the basis of a historical narrative. That's the Deuterano mist, the narrator from Joshua to Kings. The connections between D and DTR are clear for all to see. Right? Kugel talks about that. I give you on the handout one brief example from the first chapter of the book of Joshua. You don't have to get very far to see in the book of Joshua that you're still in the world of Deuteronomy the world of its rhetoric, the world of its ideas. And this is straight through to the end of the Book of Kings. The key historical problem, as any of my Hebrew Bible PhD students will tell you, is uh, how to figure out the connection between these two facts. Fact number one, the Book of Deuteronomy was that book found in the temple in Josiah's time in 621 BCE. Of this, we are 99.9% sure as the Book of Deuteronomy. However, two... The, the book of Kings, as we have it, goes down well past 621 BCE, goes down, in fact, to the destruction of the temple and the exile in 587 BCE, and, and then a little bit beyond. There are one or two little paragraphs at the end that take it a little bit beyond. So how do we figure out the connection between Deuteronomy 621 and the book of Joshua through Kings, which ends with post-587 BCE, and then also say it's all one and the same school. So clearly then, Deuteronomy in 621 is launching a process or a school of writers who continue to write after that time. And needless to say, modern Bible scholars with their customary ingenuity, right, now propose a whole series of Deuteronomic writers. There's Deuteronomic writer one, Deuteronomic writer two, Deuteronomic writer three, with different levels, different uh, chronological uh, uh, termini, each one adds on to the next, revises the previous one, the earlier writer didn't know what the later writer, the later writer didn't know what the earlier writer, the usual, right. So there is an entire small cottage industry among bio, modern Bible scholars to disentangle the Deuteronomic school into its various constituent sources and layers. Needless to say, we will not be doing any of that here. I'm simply acknowledging we have a chronological issue. If the book is from 621, then how come its continuators are going down to 587? Clearly, there is a school, not just a single writer, but a school of writers. 
And then let's talk about the, sto- the stories themselves, and then we'll, then we'll get to the book of Joshua. So what is the master narrative? If we accept modern, modern, modern Bible scholarly reconstruction, there is the book of Deuteronomy, which begins with Deuteronomy School, and narrators begin with Deuteronomy and can take the story down to the book of Kings. What is their story? Well, there is a kind of master story. So in the book of Deuteronomy, we have Moses and his farewell discourses. Very little action in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Moses gives his farewell stories, uh, sermon, laws, songs. That's the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies, right? Short of his goal, right? He's a poignant hero, doesn't quite make it to the promised land. He sees it on the horizon, but he can't get there. That's, Mo- that's the book of Deuteronomy. Joshua, book of Joshua. book of Joshua then continues the story. The book of Joshua takes the story of Joshua, successor to Moses, leads the Israelites across the Jordan River, leads them into the Promised Land, the land of Canaan, and uh, there are some initial battles there, famously Jericho and Ai, the two, two, stories he, two cities he encounters in the Transjordan, across the Jordan. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, and then we have uh, this, the narrative sort of loses itself, but fundamentally what we have in the book of Joshua is an orderly conquest of the land of Canaan, The land is apportioned among the tribes. Each of the tribes receive its share. And at the end, we have a covenant ceremony in which Joshua uh, reconfirms the link between God and the Israelites now settled on their land. That's the book of Joshua. Then we come to the book of Judges. The book of Judges, if Joshua is about order, the book of Judges is about disorder, right? Uh, Namely, there is no strong central authority, nor in the language of the book of Judges. In those days, there was yet no king in Israel, Right? Ein Melech Israel. The phrase appears half a dozen times in the book of Judges. Right? There is no king. There is no strong central authority. It's more or less every man for himself or every tribe for itself. Uh, we have chaos in the land. Different judges rise up to uh, resolve various conflicting or uh, difficult situations. We'll come back to that shortly, too. That's the book of Judges. Then we get to the book of Samuel, where we have the rise of what we might call a charismatic monarchy. And that's Saul, right? We Israelites, we need a king. We realize we can't live without a king. We need a, I mean, look at the book of Judges, it's chaos, right? We need a strong central authority. Let's get a king. Samuel, you're the prophet. You go pick us for us a king. Samuel, the prophet, picks for them a king, Saul. Saul is a tragic hero, right? At least that's how he's depicted, right? He's the hero, he's a, big, he's a good guy, he means well, but alas, Saul falls short. And uh, very short, and he falls short most noticeably in the fact that he does not establish a dynastic monarchy. Saul is a one-generation king. When he dies, his son Jonathan dies with him, right in the same battle, and that's it. That's the storyline. Scholars, of course, see all kinds of other things going on beneath the surface of the text, but that's the story. So the charismatic king is a one-generation phenomenon. That's in the book of uh, Samuel. This is then emerged in the book of 2 Samuel, emerged by, is, is followed by the emergence of a dynastic kingship. That's King David. So we have a story in 1 Samuel into 2 Samuel is a kind of biography, as it were, of David. Who is this David fellow? Where does he come from? And how does he ri- his rise into fame and fortune? That's uh, King David who then establishes a dynastic monarchy, that's 2 Samuel. And the dynastic monarchy means, of course, that his son will succeed him, that's Solomon. So the great glory of uh, David and Solomon, that's 1 Kings, first half of 1 Kings. So what have we gotten so far? We have the Israelites, the land of Canaan, established, land, tribes, apportioned. We try one kind of kingship, it didn't work too well. We try another kind of kingship, this is the one that is officially sanctioned by God, then that's the kingship. Solomon builds the temple. Here we have the apogee, right? The, great, the greatest time of success, triumph, glory, uh, the reign of Solomon. And then, doom. Or not quite doom, disaster. Right. Solomon was, everything was going great with Solomon until, until, until the foreign women whom he married led him astray. That's what 
foreign women do, right? They lead you astray. They led Solomon astray to worship other gods. God became wrathful, right, at Solomon's disloyalty, and that pretty much uh, raises up the uh, pro- um, challenges, uh, the dynastic pretensions of Solomon, so that when he dies, and remember, I'm skipping over some details here, the kingdom splits. There is now a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. This is both punishment for Solomon's sin, Solomon's disloyalty to God, but at the same time, however, the northern kingdom is itself sinful, is itself illegitimate, according to the narrator of the Book of Kings, because they have no right to rebel against the officially appointed, divinely sanctioned king, namely the house of David. The northern kingdom is set up both to punish Solomon for his sin, and yet at the same time, it itself is sinful. And if you say that's not entirely logical, well, okay. But that's the narrator of the Book of Kings. So the northern kingdom is illegitimate from day one. Nothing they can do to make themselves legitimate. right? And the narrator is constantly harping on how sinful and bad the northern kingdom is. Okay, we've seen some of that already in the case of Jeroboam, you remember, who built two cult sites in Don and Bethel. So the northern kingdom is doomed. And the narrator, however, tries very hard to hide, to gloss over the fact that there were times when it was actually quite prosperous. There were times when it was far more prosperous than the southern kingdom. There were times when it was clearly a more higher profile kingdom than the southern one. So that some of its most wicked kings are the ones who have the longest reigns. Okay, so the facts don't always agree, but at least it's trying hard to shape the narrative. Northern Kingdom dies in 721 BCE, conquered by the Assyrians. Uh, the Judah, the, tri- the southern kingdom, the one of Judah, the one that remained loyal to the house of David, persists until 587 BCE. And that's where the second kings ends, with one or two little paragraphs at the end. That's the master narrative told by the Deuteronomic narrator. Why is Saul called charismatic? Is there a particular reason for it? Yeah, because I read Max Weber. That's why I'm calling him. Right. He's, the book of Samuel does not call Saul charismatic. Okay. You know how to say charismatic in Hebrew? No. Charismati. That's, that's, right. There is no word. Right. There is no word. Right. So, uh, but is, is charismatic meaning that... Uh, he is, he is suffused with the divine spirit. He, in fact, Saul is among the prophets in that one extraordinary scene where he is ecstatic, apparently has possession, is ecstatic possession. So he's charismatic in that sense. He's anointed with oil and the spirit of the Lord fills him and he goes out and does mighty deeds as well as roll around in the dirt in ecstatic possession. Right, that's Saul. So it's charismatic in that sense. His authority comes from his inner charisma. As opposed to a Davidic monarchy, where the authority comes from institutional, dynastic uh, or in, uh, pretensions or claims. Institutional. Okay, that's the contrast. Thank you. Good question. Okay, let's now talk about what the Deuteronomic history is about. Or what's the point? Or what's the thesis of the Deuteronomic history? And that's the first important point to recognize. The Deuteronomic history, Joshua through Kings, has a thesis. It is not simply a pale, bold uh, chronicle. Right? This is an author with a point. What is his point? His main point is to demonstrate how God exercises providential supervision of human affairs. Not just human affairs, but specifically the Israelites. Or to put it very bluntly, how God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. And everything comes out okay. As long as you allow a little flexibility in divine bookkeeping, then indeed, according to the author of Kings, the author of Joshua through Kings, God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. And this can be demonstrated by historical narrative. It's not simply a sermon, it's a historical narrative. And of course, of all the sins... The one that uh, the author of, of Joshua through Kings has some favorite ones. Uh, sins, of course, of disloyalty to God, worshiping other gods, 
sins of following the ways of the aboriginal inhabitants of the land. And then once we get to the, narrative, to the kingly part, uh, after Solomon, sins of disloyalty to the temple by building cult sites outside the temple, or sins of worshipping other gods by building cult sites to them. These are the repertoire of sins that the author harps on again and again and again throughout the narrative. And of course, sin brings with it condign punishment. With the tragic climaxes of 721, when the northern kingdom is finally gotten rid of by God, and 587, when the southern kingdom meets a similar fate. That's the theological arc of the book. The book of Judges has this amazing statement at the very beginning in chapter 2, uh, one of the chapters I ask you to read, where the, the narrator there steps outside the narrative for a moment and says, now, dear reader, I'm going to explain to you, he doesn't say dear reader, that's Shai Cohen adding that part, but that's what, in effect, what he's doing. He's saying, now, dear reader, I'm going to give you, I'll tell you up front what the book of Judges is about, the narrator says. This is what's going to happen. What's going to happen is the Israelites are settled in their land and they're sitting pretty and comfy. As a result, they don't worship the Lord or trust in the Lord. As a result, they then start to worship other gods. God then blows up at them and sends some foreign oppressor to come and attack them. The king of the Ammonites, the Philistines, the whatever, the Midianites. Right? They come, and, they come and attack them. And the Israelites suffer terribly until the Israelites return to the Lord. Here's Deuteronomic rhetoric compared to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Right here, the Israelites return to the Lord in repentance and the Lord then sends them a champion who will redeem them. A judge. A champion who will redeem them. And after that, the cycle starts over again. So the narrator is telling you in Judges chapter 2, he's got a plan and a purpose. He has a master plan here. He knows history is going to be used by him in order to demonstrate the truth of his theological judgments. You don't have to trust Shia Cohen and modern Bible scholars for their brilliant analysis. It's right there in the text, Judges chapter 2. He tells you, this is a programmatic narrative. And he tells you his program. It's actually an amazing chapter. I don't know of anything else like it anywhere in the narratives of the Hebrew Bible, where the narrator basically talks to you. So, collective punishment by God. Let's talk about that for, uh, for a moment. So, God then rewards the righteous, but let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen, there aren't too many righteous people here who come across these pages. They're mostly sinners. Right? The narrative is really about sin and its punishment. So, how does... How does um, Punishment follows sin. Well, the narrator doesn't have a kind of simple or simplistic direct approach where a sinner does something bad on Monday and on Tuesday he drops dead. No, 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 no. That's not the way the world works. Of course, it's far more nuanced. It's far more complicated, uh, far more subtle than that. But he does clearly believe in both synchronic and diachronic punishment. Namely, if one person or a group of persons, especially distinguished people, do something sinful, then the entire nation suffers. The entire nation suffers, especially if the sinner is a king, on the theory that the king is the nation. So if the king, suffer, the king is wicked, then innocent Israelites suffer too. And that apparently is perfectly okay in his mind. This is just classic example in these chapters is the story at the very, very end of 2 Samuel, where King David undertakes a census of the people of Israel, which, according to the narrator, is a sinful act. We don't have time to deal with that right now. Right? So David does, undertakes a sinful census. He does it. And the result is plague. Devastation. Which the entire people suffer. Ah, you object, it's not fair. King David is the sinner, why should we all suffer? Answer, he's the king. So the narrator understands that to be perfectly fair. You and I might disagree, but the narrator's understanding of divine justice, this is a perfectly fine, acceptable way to behave. That's what we mean by synchronic, people who are alive at the same time, or what you might call horizontal punishment. 
horizontal, maybe following a generation of a, of a given moment. As opposed to diachronic, which the narrator also thinks is perfectly fair and reasonable. Namely, that children suffer for the sins of their parents. So, classic example of that in the Book of Kings, where he constantly refers to the sin of Jeroboam. Who's Jeroboam? Right. Jeroboam is the fellow who led the northern tribes into rebellion against Solomon's successor. A little unclear in the narrative, if maybe he started it already when Solomon was alive, but whatever. He comes to uh, full flower after Solomon's death, uh, Solomon's death, and he leads the, the northern tribes in secession uh, against uh, the royal house at, of, of David and against the southern tribes. Now that's Jeroboam. That is a sin for which the narrator cannot forgive Jeroboam. And he can never forgive the entire northern kingdom because that sin festers. That sin, the sin of rebellion against Solomon, and the sin of building those two obscene uh, calf-centered cult sites in Dan and Bethel. Dan in the north, Bethel in the south, right? And he refers to it again and again and again, the sin of Jeroboam, the sin of Jeroboam, the sin of Jeroboam. And ultimately, it's the sin of Jeroboam that will explain why the northern kingdom fell in 721 BCE. And if you object, but that's like 300 years later. Give me a break. That doesn't make any sense. Answer, it doesn't make sense to you, but it makes perfect good sense to the narrator of the Book of Kings. This is fair. This is divine justice at work. So the people alive in 721 BCE are suffering for their perpetuation of the sin of Jeroboam. That's diachronic punishment. I mean, parents and children, right, which for him is seen as just. This is not divine severity. This is simply justice. Now, interestingly enough, there is one passage in the Book of Kings, which is, I give you the reference here, in which he makes clear that it's okay for God to run his books, his divine accounting this way, that children suffer for the sins of their parents, or in the case of Jeroboam, it's the great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren who are suffering for the sins of their parents. Uh, but, of course, we humans don't do that. Right? Loyum tu avot albanim, albanim loyum tu alavot. You have in the book of Deuteronomy, where right? children may not be put to death for the sins of their parents, nor parents for the sins of their children. You die for your own sin, says Deuteronomy, and in fact, the book of Kings even refers to it. So the book, of, the narrator knows what is just for God in divine bookkeeping may not be the way humans uh, administer justice. All right, just a small, interesting, interesting note. In other words, Joshua through Kings. Are we reading a history book here, class? Are we reading a book that we would call a history book? No. What you're reading is a theology book. It just looks like a history book because it's full of names and dates and wars and kings and battles and, and, what, and whatnot. Right? But it's not really a history book. Not the way a history book such as we're familiar with, with our notion of history. It's something else. It's a book of theology or theological ruminations on divine control of human events as illustrated by stories of the uh, Israelites, and especially their kings. That's a summary. That's what it is. Or to put it differently, if you ask the narrator, where is, where is the truth of your narrative, whereas I think the narrator would tell us, Deuteron the Deuteronomist would say, well, I'm not lying anywhere, but I am giving a selective reading of facts to make, to make them to illustrate the truth. The truth is, God rewards the righteous, punishes the wicked, God supervises human affairs. That's the truth of my narrative. And it's not my job to collect alternate versions of offense. It's not my job to uh, analyze my sources. It's not my job to sit and compare and contrast outsider perspective versus insider perspective. That's not my job. If you want to do that, go to the Greeks to learn how to write a history. But that's not what I've been doing. There's a 
uh, two famous chapters in Jeremiah and Ezekiel where they discuss this very point directly in which they deny the doctrine of children suffering for sins of parents. They say it's simply not true. It doesn't work that way. So clearly what, what was plausible for the Deuteronomic writer was no longer plausible a generation or two later or people who lived through the destruction of 587 BCE, that was no longer palatable. So it was palatable until it no longer was. Uh, that is a giant question which is, I believe, still on the scholarly agenda. Right. Namely, uh, we have here it's a, several questions wrapped up together. First we have this David and Solomon stuff which we, as you read it, especially the young David stuff, it sure looks and sounds like legend. It sure looks and sounds like, I don't know, King Arthur and Knights of the Round Table. You know, I don't know, what, what am I reading here? I don't know, it's entertaining stories, but God knows this is history or not. Right, so at some point we understand the narrative shifts from the mythical, or legendary perhaps might be a better word here, from the legendary to historical. At what point does the narrative become historical, i.e. does the narrator have actual historical data? Uh, that's one way to phrase, phrase the question. Another way to phrase the question would be, we understand that the narrator has a, has a theological agenda. Does that mean the narrator is deliberately distorting, suppressing, rewriting uh, uh, historical facts, quote-unquote, in order to maintain his narrative, in order to maintain his thesis? These are tough, tough questions. And modern Bible scholars will argue endlessly about this point. In brief, we have the minimalists and the maximalists. The minimalists out there, the ones who say there's almost no useful historical data hiding anywhere in the Book of Kings. It's not in archaeology. I don't believe it. The only thing I believe are pots and pans dug up out of the earth. That I believe, but otherwise there's stuff in the narrative. I don't believe a word of it. Those are the minimalists. And the maximalists are the ones who say, no, it's fundamentally accurate. It is, has a theological bent, to be sure. But it's fundamentally accurate as long as we need to take into account the author's theological uh, 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 premises and theses. And then we have everybody in between. So by the 8th century BC, by the 700s, we start to get outside references in the Syrian chronicles and such to events that are described in the Book of Kings. So details. So by then, the, the fog of legend has lifted and we have historical data. Okay, we'll come back to some of this, but uh, yeah, this is tough. So whoever asked that question, you should go to graduate school, get a PhD in Hebrew Bible, and you can try to solve this. Two stories I asked you to look at uh, from the book of Joshua are two, uh, two famous stories. One is the story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. Right? Everybody knows the, uh, the spiritual about Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. So what's the point of that story? God does miracles. This is actually unusual in the book of Joshua through Kings. Generally speaking, the narrator does not play up the miraculous. Unlike the Exodus story, which is all about displays of divine power. The Exodus narrative is all about miracles. However, Joshua through Kings, for the most part, the narrator does not play up miracles. Everything is quote-unquote rational. People behave in rational ways and do rational things. Armies go out to battle. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. But here, in the Jericho story, of course, it is miraculous. What brings down the walls of Jericho in the end? Is it siege technology? Is it sappers uh, 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 digging tunnels under the walls? Is it a helicopter raid by uh, the Navy <coughs> SEAL team? So what brings down Jericho? They march around the wall seven times with the ark, and they blow the shofar. And they do that for seven days. Footnote, including, by the way, the Sabbath, it seems. Back to my narrative. Uh, seven times around the walls, and they blow the shofars, and then, boom, the walls come a-tumbling down. It's a great story, but, uh, you know, for those of us who are a dedicated rationalists, uh, this story doesn't make any sense. It's obviously a legend, or it's the miraculous. There's very little of that in Joshua through Kings. Very little of that. For the most part, he eschews such stories. 
Things don't work on the pretty rational level. But anyway, there it is. There's the Jericho story. The I story which follows it, right, is a story again of collective punishment. Because one man's sin, Achan, commits a sin, the people of Israel are defeated in battle. Until the sinner is revealed and he is punished. Interestingly enough, the sinner and his whole family are punished. So here we see in this story, we see the collective punishment notion, which again seemed to the narrator is perfectly fair and just. Even though you and I would not like it. Okay, so the storyline of the book of Joshua. As I mentioned earlier, Josh, Moses dies, Joshua succeeds him, leads the people across the Jordan River, they come and attack the Transjordan, Jericho, Ai, etc., and then they gradually conquer the entire land of Canaan and apportion the land among the tribes, and the story ends with a covenantal renewal ceremony, and Joshua dies. That's the storyline story of the book of Joshua. What's the ideologically, how is this narrative too ideologically motivated? If indeed it is. Here I come back to that point we discussed already a couple of weeks ago with the story of Abraham. Abraham comes to the land of Canaan from Mesopotamia, from far away. In other words, that story is saying, we are not of this place. Right? God makes a covenant with Abraham to give him and his descendants the land of Canaan. Because it's not his now. He's from somewhere else. He has to get it. So, I'm just reminding you of things we've discussed already, we've already seen. Genesis 15, Genesis 17. God chooses Abraham and his descendants. They choose God. Covenantal ceremony. Shaking hands, as it were. God gives promises to give them the land of Canaan. Abraham is a foreigner. They settle in the land for a time, and then you recall under Jacob and Joseph, the tribes wind up going into Egypt, where they are enslaved for several hundred years, and then they return. In other words, they are foreigners yet a second time around. First time around, the foreigners, they arrive as foreigners in the person of Abraham. Second time around, they come as foreigners in the persons of the escaped slaves from Egypt. The mountain of the Lord is also outside the land of Israel. So a clear theme here is we, Israelites, live in the land of Canaan, but we are not Canaanites. And that, I would say, is the ideological point of the conquest narrative in the book of Joshua, which is to put teeth into this. Yes, we live in the land of Canaan, but we came from somewhere else, and we conquered it, and then we settled here. It's part of this theme. We are not of this place. Now, I commented then, this is a very odd foundation myth. Right? A much better foundation myth would be, we've always been here. We've never not been here. We are autochthonous. A great word. We are autochthonous. This is what the Athenians said. We grow up out of the soil. We come out forth from the very ground itself. But no, the Israelite story is the opposite of that. We're the opposite of autochthonous. We are parvenus. We only arrived here recently. We conquered this place and kicked out the Canaanites, or destroyed them. I'll we'll come to that in one second. Why do they tell such an odd story? Well, if you're a traditionalist, obviously the answer is because it's true. But if you're a modern Bible scholar, you know there's a conspiracy here. You know there's some sinister, deep, dark truth that somebody doesn't want you to know. So if you are a modern Bible scholar, you say, the entire conquest story is nonsense. It's lies. 
recall our discussion about the Exodus, the, the first part of that story. Do we believe in the Exodus narrative? Well, if you're a modern Bible scholar, the answer probably is no. Or what you, the most of you would concede would be that, the, yeah, there was an exodus of some tribal elements from Egypt, and they made their way to Canaan, into the, into the people of Israel, and that story of a small part of the people became then uh, enlarged, exaggerated, embe- uh, inflated, to become the story of the entire people with a mighty display of divine power. But if there's a historical kernel at all, it was a story about a small group, perhaps the Levites. That's, re- that's review. Now, now. So, we have here 603,500 adult Israelite males wandering around the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. On the face of it, that already is strange our credulity. Not to mention women, children, and assorted hangers-on, and cattle. For 40 years, okay, I believe that. Maybe, Right? And then we come to the, uh, they come to the land of Canaan where they, they conquer it. The problem is, this vision of this orderly conquest of the book of Joshua is contradicted by the opening chapters of the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, it seems, the narrator there goes, goes out of his way to point out that different tribes are conquering different places. Apparently, it's all random and episodic. Uh, and there is no central authority at all. And then the narrator goes on to say, even more amazingly, that they failed. They tried to conquer the Canaanites, but they failed. They couldn't kick them out. They didn't kick them out. That's the opening chapters, and then, of course, they will pay the penalty for it because they'll be led astray to their foreign gods. That's, then, the, then the narrator gives us that, hepa, that programmatic chapter. That does not sound like the book of Joshua to me where the book of Joshua has, in fact, the Israelites in orderly procession, orderly succession, conquering all the Canaanites, uprooting them, taking over their lands and their cities. In fact, there's a whole long list of Canaanite cities that are conquered. So that's fishy right there. Then modern Bible scholars observe that there is zero, no archaeological evidence to, of a destruction layer of around the right time to document, to support the idea that the Israelites conquered the land of Canaan. Oh, this point has been discussed endlessly. Is there a destruction layer of the right time and place in Jericho, where we have destruction layers, but apparently it's too early, it's too late? Okay, scholars, they argue endlessly. At the end of the day, there is no smoking gun. You want a destruction layer documenting Israelite conquest? You won't find one. So, if we don't trust the conquest narrative, then what is our narrative? Or to put it bluntly, where do the people of Israel come from? Or who are they? If they're not runaway escaped slaves from Egypt of Mesopotamian origin, then who are they? I'll tell you, class. Here's that deep, dark secret that the narrator is trying desperately to conceal from you. They're Canaanites! or rather, to put it more bluntly, right? the people of Israel emerge as a distinct group with its own identity, history, self-conception, and so on, as a result of very complicated processes, of which we are but dimly informed, within the land of Canaan. Especially the highlands. Remember this map? The central highlands. This is not the plain. As it says in the book of Judges, we can't go down into the plain because they have chariots down there. We're up in the highlands. That's where we Israelites hang out. In other words, in the, on the plains, they have tanks, is what we would say in modern English. They have chariots. They have tanks. We can't do anything with them. We're up in the highlands. That's where we, are lo- we Israelites are located. And as a result of different social tensions within the central highlands, this is where Israelites emerge as a group in distinction from Canaanites. So we have different models in uh, different scholars. Different, there's an immigration model, a revolt model, a gradual emergence model, whatever. Whatever model you want to pick, we don't know exactly, but presumably the Israelites emerge in this, from that society 
as a distinctive group, which then becomes a network of tribes and then turns into a people of its own. Okay? And one of the hallmark identifiers of this new people, people of Israel, is they don't eat pork. One way you know an Israelite settlement, archaeologically speaking, is you look around for pig bones and you don't find any. Here's where food becomes a cultural marker or a cultural identifier. The Canaanites are busy eating pork, as most people do, but the Israelites don't. But, fundamentally, they are a group that emerged from the Canaanites. Now we understand the point of this repeated statement, we are not from this place, we are from somewhere else, because we're trying very much to give ourselves a foreign identity, to make it clear that we are not these people whose practices, religion, way of life, uh, mode of worshipping the gods, we abhor. Okay, let's talk about killing the Canaanites. According to Deuteronomy, we have explicit laws on the handout, uh, on, the, on the lecture notes, Deuteronomy chapter 7, that uh, the Israelites, when they arrive uh, in, in the land of Canaan, or back to our notes, thank you, right, uh, chapter 7, that you are to destroy utterly the Canaanites. And we have seven Canaanite nations are, are listed. You must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Giving your daughters to their sons and taking the daughters with you. For that would turn away your children and follow me to serve other gods, etc., etc. I find the sequence of clauses here a little odd. That first you should destroy them and then you shouldn't marry them. Whereas I, I might have thought that's not entirely logical. But okay, it's just, that's just me. Anyway, chapter 7 uh, they are to utterly destroy the Canaanites. And this is repeated in Exodus chapter 34, which is probably also a D passage. Well, what do we do with that class? Are the Israelites guilty of genocide? Or ethnocide? And here I would say, paradoxically, if you are a traditionalist and you think that Moses wrote the Torah dictated by God, then I would say you, especially if you are a progressive, modern, liberal type person, you would be shocked and offended by these passages. Especially if God is commanding the Israelites to commit genocide, i.e. to wipe out the seven Canaanite nations. Whereas modern Bible scholars here, it seems to me, have a much more logical explanation. Did the Israelites wipe out this Canaanite nations class? No. It says explicitly in the book of Judges that they didn't. Absolutely not. So they didn't do it. However, the point of the passage is, not that they did, the point of the passage is to show the depth of our abhorrence of Canaanites and Canaanite ways. So this passage, too, is ideologically motivated. Not because we want you to kill the Canaanites, because we, we know already that you didn't. And by the time this passage is written, I don't know if there are any Canaanites left. This is in Deuteronomy. We're talking about the 7th century B.C. Are there any blue-blooded Canaanites still running around by this point? I would say probably not, because they've all been blended into the people of Israel. There I say it. But the point of, the, of, this, of this law, then, is to enforce this uh, rhetorical claim that we Israelites are not Canaanites. We're the opposite of Canaanites. So much so is that we would kill them if we could. We didn't. Okay, true. But okay, retrospect, we should have. So is it a nice law? No, it's class. It's not a nice law. And if I had my druthers, would I take it out of the Torah? Yes, I would take it out. If I had my druthers, it's one of those chapters I wish were not there. But there it is. And here I think its, it's effect is not to convince Israelites to kill anyone. The point of the passage is that we Israelites see ourselves as anti-Canaanites, as non-Canaanites. My very last uh, uh, bullet point. Only the Canaanites and the Amalekites have this rhetorical function as being capital O other, as being so other we really should kill them. But instead we marry them. But we really should kill them. 
Only the Canaanites and the Amalekites. Our other neighboring tribes, apparently, never developed that sense of opposition or uh, antagonism that would de- which we define ourselves as not that. That's only Canaanites, only Amalekites. When it comes to Ammonites, Moabites, Edomites, and Ishmaelites, they're just neighboring tribes. Maybe because in the book of Genesis, we, were, we Israelites are related to them in some way. But not even Philistines, who are not related to us at all and who are uncircumcised. And the narrative goes, emphasizes over and over again how the uncircumcised Philistines, uncircumcised Philistines. So we are different from them because we're circumcised and they are not. But even they were nowhere, is there any, any uh, injunction to go off and kill all the Philistines? No, on the contrary. There are neighboring tribes. We go to war with them. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we lose. Fine. The God uses them to punish us. Okay, that's normal stuff. That's just the Philistines. So something about the Canaanites, specifically, the seven Canaanite nations that Israelite tradition remembers are particularly O other, capital O other. We are not them, and they are not us, even though historically, originally, they probably were. Okay, everybody, that's the end of Joshua and Judges. So next, on Wednesday, we'll come back and talk about Samuel and Kings.